Christ is risen. It is such a joy to be able to celebrate Resurrection Sunday with you all. We were blessed this morning by, by an actual sunrise. Uh, we didn't look like we'd get a sunrise this morning. It was pretty cloudy, but just about an inch of, of sky above the horizon uh, was, was actually clear. And you, I wish you could have seen it. For those of you who were there, you saw why it was kind of magical. Pastor Cinda was preaching, and just as literally, not making this up, just as she said the words, the gospel is true. That's when the sun broke above the horizon. <laughs> it was like, ooh. <laughs> it was really cool. God is in power. God is, is love and joy and hope. And that is why we gather today, not just to remember something in the past, but to celebrate the current hope that we have in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Holy God, we do thank you and we praise you that your gospel is true. Just as the sun rises every day, whether we can see it or not, your gospel is true both yesterday, today, and forever. Lord God, we pray that you would be with us this morning, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us, that we may hear your words and not just be hearers, but doers also. Lord, use these words to transform our lives, our hearts, our minds, our souls that we may be equipped to share your good news with the rest of the world. And Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our, our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As we turn to scripture today, um, there's a psalm that I love that is usually reserved for Good Friday. It starts out with words that you know well, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But that psalm ends at a totally different note. And I wanted to use this this morning for our Old Testament reading, the transformation that God can make from where are you, God, to the triumph of the cross. This is Psalm 22, starting with verse 22. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Amen. So let's turn over to the familiar story. This is the, the, the Gospel of Luke's version of, of the Resurrection Sunday morning. This is Luke 24, starting with verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of Jesus Christ. When they were, while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over into the hands of the sinners to be crucified and on the third day, he will be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they all came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to the, all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I don't know if many of you have had the privilege of going to the Holy Land. I've been a couple of times, um, and I remember the very first time I went to the tomb of the Holy Sepulcher. It's supposed to be the tomb of Jesus. It's, it's uh, the, the, the first church in that spot was built at about 300 AD, and they've sort of added on to it, so it's this huge complex. But right in the middle is the tomb itself. 
And you have to wait in, in line for a while, but you're able to, to duck down, go through this like four foot high uh, doorway, and then you can go into the place they say that the tomb was. So I, I did that. I lined up. I did the thing. I, I you know, I've, I've had been a Christian all of my life, and I know the story. I got in there, and I, it is funny how certain things catch you off guard. I got in and went, it is empty. <laughs> Like, what was I expecting here? <laughs> Every tomb you've probably ever visited has somebody in it. And, and somehow my body was still thinking there's going to be something in this. But you get there and there's nothing there. There was just this beautiful frieze on the wall of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The tomb really is empty. It was funny. I expected it to be empty, but somehow my expectations were a little bit goofy. And, and that kind of thing happened with that first Easter Sunday. They had absolutely no expectations at all that they, would, that they would not find a body in that tomb. They completely expected. The, the women, um, it, it, it's like this chapter, is, it starts with the same paragraph that the last chapter ends with. And it says in Luke 23, 55, the women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph of Arimathea, saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home, prepared spices and perfumes. They rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. And then on the first day, they went back to the tomb with their spices. It is one breath. They were not expecting to find a body. And for the rest of this whole chapter, as it all unfolds, as Luke, uh, the incredible storyteller, gives you one vignette after another, you see that none of these people were expecting a, a risen Jesus. They weren't expecting their lives to change forever. But God blew through their expectations. God had so much bigger ministry planned for them. He, he had, uh, it wasn't that all hell was going to break loose. It was that all heaven was going to break loose. They had no idea because they had such low expectations of God. And don't we sometimes have low expectations of God ourselves? But we need to, to open our, our minds and hearts to the story. And as we do this, think about what expectations you have this morning coming to Easter service. What are you expecting God to do? What are you expecting to find here? I want you to think about that as we think about these expectations that, that these disciples had that, that were just blown out of the water by what they found. As, as we look at this story, as the, the Again, the women had, had prepared the spices. They were going to do the thing with the spices. They knew what they had to do. They were going to be faithful. Um, in one of the other gospels, it says they were wondering how they were going to move the stone away. But they, the last thing they expected to find was an empty tomb. They, they, they weren't just going and saying, you know, well, we'll keep the spices in case he's dead. <laughs> but but, but they, they did not go expecting an alive Jesus. And what happened? They find the stone tossed aside. Not just rolled, but tossed aside. And here is an angel. They look in. There's no body. They don't know what to think, but it's, it's empty. They had seen it full just, just a few days earlier. They'd seen it full on Friday night and it's Sunday morning. And, and of course, their first thought, we get more of that in, in, in John as Mary Magdalene is asking somebody she thought was the gardener, what have you done with his body so I can go and get it? Their first thought was not, wow, it is true he's risen. Their first thought was who stole the body? Their expectation was a human-sized expectation. And they turn around, they look out, and here is this angel sitting on top of the stone. And he's saying, why are you looking for the living among the dead? What a question. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? They, he is not here. He is risen. He's not here. I, I, he, and then he says, don't you remember how he said? I mean, Jesus told people over and over and over. We've talked about that recently on Sunday mornings, how, how Jesus warns them. I have to die. I will be dead for three days, and then I will rise again. But they, they, it just didn't go in. And so when the angel says that, don't you remember, <laughs> it was like the women go, oh, that's what that meant? <laughs> I had no idea. 
So they are, are, are ecstatic and blown away. Luke doesn't mention in, the, in his gospel that Jesus actually appears to, to them. Jesus, Luke wants to, to highlight this lack of expectation thing. So they go back to the disciples then. How do you think the disciples are going to receive this news? The disciples had been taught, just like, uh, just like the women had, that, that Jesus was going to die and be in the tomb for three days and rise again. But when the women come to the, the disciples and tell them what happened, the disciples literally think they're nuts. Luke uses a medical term here, but it's for mental illness. It's like, it's the root word that we get the, the word delirious from. They thought that they were, these women were delirious. Like, what are you talking about? They, they gave them no credence at all. Women were not reliable witnesses. They were not allowed to, to t- testify in court unless there was a male to corroborate their, their witness. So why should they believe these women who were clearly delusional when they had gone to this tomb where, where they knew Jesus' body was? But Peter, you remember what happened to Peter just a few days earlier. Peter was the one who had had all of this stuff and bravado and said, Jesus, you know, wash my hands and feet, wash my whole body. He, he, he was, I'm with you forever, Lord. And Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter had sent, spent two days in, in horror and just self-doubt and, and, and guilt and shame. Peter, the, his only hope was that if Jesus was alive, maybe this is true, maybe I'll have a chance to say I'm sorry, maybe I'll have a chance to lay this down again. So Peter races to the tomb. He doesn't know what he's gonna find, but he, he wants to know that there might be some little hope His expectations are not high either. He doesn't even know what he sees. He walks in the door. Peter, bending over, he saw strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. That was the extent of Peter's hope. He went away wondering. Peter had no expectations that Jesus was alive. He he just knew that something had happened, and he didn't get it. What in the world was that? He has this wonder, but he's still kind of at a loss. So then the next vignette that Luke turns to is the scene of of the walk to Emmaus. Two of the the disciples were walking back, back home to Emmaus. They, they, They had heard the crazy story of the women who were delusional saying that the tomb was empty. Um, they, they knew that, that, that Peter had gone and, and confirmed that it was empty, but they left right after that. It's like, there's too many weird things going on. We just want to go home. They were walking to Emmaus, which is about seven miles away. So if you think about the Cathedral of Learning from here, that's about seven miles. So they were walking to the Cathedral of Learning from Mount Lebanon, and, and this guy joins them along the way. Luke, being an awesome storyteller, tells the readers who this is, but the people in the story don't know. It's Jesus. Jesus starts unpacking everything that's going on. He he pretends to not know what just happened in Jerusalem, and so the the, the disciples were like, how can you not know? Uh, So then he begins to say, didn't you know it had to be this way? Again, their expectations were completely off. Didn't you know the Son of Man had to come and die and give his life? And Jesus takes it from Moses and the prophets and goes all the way through the arc of human history to show God's redemptive plan and how every single thing connects together. Wouldn't you have loved to be a fly on the wall for that conversation? Some of you are, I love Lucy fans. I love one of my favorite things. When people ask, what's the first question you're gonna ask God when you get to heaven? My quote is from I Love Lucy. It's Ricky Ricardo going, okay, Lucy, splain. <laughs> so in this moment, you have Jesus spl- splaining. He's finally unpacking how it all connects together. That hidden logic that we don't see from the outside, but from God's perspective, he's got a plan the whole way through. They still don't know who he is until they invite him to have dinner with them in Oakland. (laughs) And he sits down with them and he takes bread and he gives thanks and he breaks it. And their eyes are open and he disappears. Can you imagine that moment when this tangible guy that you just thought was somebody who was wise that you were walking with, all of a sudden you realize that it's Jesus. And then he disappears. 
They see him, they don't know what happened, they're still confused, but they're excited, so they decide to run all the way back. Can you imagine, you walked all the way to Oakland and now you're walking all the way back to Mount Lebanon because you have to tell everybody what just happened. So they run back to the disciples and, and the disciples are like, I, I know, it's weird, it's crazy, I don't know what's going on. Peter saw him, the, the women saw him, like, and they're like pulling all of their different stories together. What does this mean? I don't know. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up right in the midst of them. How do you think they would respond? Oh, cool, Jesus is here. <laughs> And they were startled and frightened, it says. They were terrified. They thought he was a ghost because he just appears in the midst of them. They, they, they were just floored. Their expectations, even though they know something miraculous has happened, their expectations are so low that they don't even think that Jesus is real. He has to convince them that he's real. This time, first it was with the bread. The second time, it was by eating a piece of fish that they had to show him that he had had a resurrected body. It wasn't just a resurrected spirit. It was an actual body. He was raised from the dead. These were the expectations that got destroyed over and over and over again. And then Jesus gave them a new expectation you better expect that your life is never going to be the same again. You are going to be my witnesses. To, for, starting in Jerusalem and then to the ends of the earth, you are going to proclaim the redemption from the forgiveness of sins to all people. And he sent them out. And, and he blessed them, and he poured his Holy Spirit on them. And the end of Luke is just the, actually the beginning of, of the book of Acts when God explodes the church through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the gospel spreads to people that they had no idea would hear the gospel by the end. They were not expecting this at all. If you had written a book about expectations, like what, what your religion should be, what, how to prove to people that Jesus did indeed rise again from the dead, they did everything wrong. Again, they would never have chosen women to be a witness. Women were not reliable, so don't listen to them. <laughs> they would never have, have, have made, the, um, made Peter the hero of the story. Peter's the, the leader of the disciples. They would never have made him into a bumbling idiot, not knowing what had happened when, uh, when he got to the tomb. They would not have made the disciples so confused. They would have shown that they knew what they were talking about. They would have had, uh, had themselves together and immediately be able to explain to people. They would never have been afraid or confused. There would not have been any of this racing back and forth. They, they wouldn't have had this, this, uh, th this doubt, even when he was standing in front of them, that they had to have him prove that he was alive by eating fish. All of these different pieces are evidence that this story, as crazy as it is, is true. This, this bunch could never have pulled off such an incredible hoax against the, the Roman soldiers. This, all of the Roman armies that were surrounding him, them. Instead, they, this is a raw story of real people with very human reactions. And their lives were changed forever. Some people think of the, the resurrection as the end of the story. Because it comes at the end of the Gospels, okay, we landed here, Jesus is alive, now go back to your regularly scheduled program. <laughs> but God wants to change their worlds and turn them upside down. One um, commentator I love, he says, the women on the way to the tomb were planning to perform one last act of love for Jesus and then probably would just return home to their former lives. Now there was no way back to the former life of Galilee. The gospel is not the end of the story. It's not the, the climax. It's the turning point. It is the turning point where our expectations are thrown out and God brings us a whole new set of ideas. He gives us a whole new idea of, of his plan for the world, of his grace, of his power, of his redemption. We see the blessings that Christ brings to these people and it completely changes their lives. Peter goes from the most shamed of the apostles to one of the greatest leaders who introduced the gospel to, to the Gentiles for the first time. 
we can see how it changed uh, the whole world. <laughs> Who would have thought just 300 years later that, that the, it, the Romans, like the Roman emperor would become a Christian himself? Who would have thought that back then that 2,000 years later, people would be gathered all around the world to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday in 2024? What are you expecting from God? Did you expect to come here and hear the same story and, and sing nostalgic songs and then go back to your life? Are you expecting God to do something the same in your life or are you expecting God to blow your mind? Are you expecting him to do immeasurably more than you could ask or imagine? God is not a safe God. This building is not a museum. The songs that we sing are not just nostalgia. The gospel is true. It is as true as that sun breaking through the horizon this morning. It is true for every single one of you. It is true when we feel like awful. It is true when we are as happy as we can be. It is true on the battlefields of this world. It is true in the political arguments of this world. Jesus Christ is risen. There are no earthly powers that are stronger than Christ. Jesus Christ has conquered sin and he has conquered death. He has conquered the brokenness in our lives and he's conquered the brokenness in this world and we desperately need his healing power. Right now we are living in this in-between time. He is risen and he will come again. We are right now in the reality of his kingdom come on earth but it is not completely fulfilled until he returns. So right now we wait and we say, God, we know that you are here. We know that you can do more than we can ask or imagine and we wanna see it right now. We are not just going through the motions. We are not making the spices to anoint a dead body. We are saying, Jesus Christ, you are the living Lord and we wanna see it. We want to see it in our lives. We want to see it in transformed lives around us. We want to see it in healed communities and healed nations. We want to see it in transformed addiction. We want to see it in reconciled families. Lord, we want to see your amazing power. Oh, Lord, give us the words. God has given us the message. He wants us to be the witnesses, you and I. How would you feel if you showed up at that tomb and found it empty and then found an angel saying, he is not here, he is risen from the dead, and then finally met Jesus face to face? I love that scene with Mary Magdalene as she sees Jesus and realizes who he is and goes to, to hug him and hold him forever. And he says, excuse me, don't cling on to me. I have a message for you. I have a mission for you. I am sending you out. God wants to, to give every single one of us a mission to tell not only the people around us, but the world that Jesus Christ is risen from the, from the dead. Whatever your expectations were, this changes everything. Let's pray together. Holy God, we do thank you and we praise you that your resurrection changes everything in the world. It changes how we expect our lives to go. It, ex it changes how we expect church to be. It, it changes the way we see the world. Lord, forgive us for the times that we have such low expectations of you. Lord, we, we don't even realize that you can change everything. Lord, we pray that you would help us not only to live Easter Sunday as you have risen indeed, but that you would help us live Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays knowing that you are the resurrected Lord. The stuff of earth, the things that we cling to for security and safety are, are just dust in face of the resurrected power of Christ. Lord, we, we put such low expectations on your power at work in us. Lord, help us to, to pray with boldness, knowing that you love to answer prayers. Lord, help us to proclaim your grace and your truth, knowing that you are a God who changes hearts. It's not our words, it's your Holy Spirit that leads people to you, but we just need to be faithful with the message. Lord, give us courage with that. Lord, I just pray a special dose of the Holy Spirit on everyone gathered to together today. 
that they would sense your presence, that they would sense the reality of your resurrection, and that it would change their lives and their expectations forever. Lord God, we never expected to be brought out of being, from being orphans into being children, daughters and sons of a king. But Lord, you adopted us into your family. You call us your dearly beloved children. And you invite us to pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please rise now as we affirm our faith in Jesus Christ through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will judge, judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be 